This video is brought to you by Warby Parker. What's up, Wisecrack? I don't know if you've heard, but there's a group of people that pretty much the whole world seems to hate right now. Whether it's America's least favorite sunscreen enthusiast, self-appointed health czar, Lex Luthor impersonator, hair transplant aficionado, or teary-eyed hedge fund manager. I care. People across the political spectrum are pissed that some folks have made bank off the recent economic crisis. Now, we all know that America's filthy rich have gotten filthier and richer in recent years, while the rest of us are trying to make a family-sized box of powdered mac and cheese last a whole week. You can save on your water bill if you just eat it dry. Still, most of us have been taught to see this as just a fact of life, a natural extension of the free market. But having massive wealth in the hands of a few tech bros wasn't necessarily preordained. We'll explain in this Wisecrack edition on billionaires. What went wrong? And before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Warby Parker. Warby Parker provides boutique quality eyewear for a great value. They're committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. They offer eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. With Warby Parker, you can finally get sunglasses, progressives, and blue light lenses that are built with your script. Their glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. If you're interested, but don't see yourself heading to the store anytime soon, you can order frames from the comfort of your couch with their free home try on program. You can get five frames shipped to your house so you can see what works best for you. If you don't have any idea of where to start, they have a quick quiz to help you decide whether you need wide frames or what styles might look best for your face shape. It only took me two minutes and I got my frames pretty soon after. I love that I had the chance to try them on, take a few pics, and ask my roommate what they thought before I sent them back to make my decision. Of course, the best part is that there is no obligation to buy in case you don't find your perfect frame. So try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. There is no obligation to buy, and it ships for free with a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free by going to warbyparker.com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. Today, having billionaires seems as natural as eating a hot dog encased in a thick layer of deep fried cornmeal batter. But for early Americans, both things would have been unthinkable, and not just because of inflation and high cholesterol. See, our 18th century countrymen overwhelmingly imagined themselves to be different from Britain, with its stuffy aristocracy, inbred kings, and generational wealth. Of course, that didn't stop some early Americans from making bank. There was a fledgling aristocracy flaunting their sick digs, much of which had been acquired in sketchy ways, like looting British ships, stealing Native American land and goods, slavery, or just ripping off the government's war effort. And everyone else? They typically lived in small towns, running small farms, or working as tradespeople, or, you know, slavery. As historian Kevin Phillips notes, outside of plantations and fledgling cities, social stratification was pretty limited. You probably weren't jealous of your rich friend's new shoes because you each most likely had only one pair of homemade shoes. While this may sound devastating to sneakerheads, it also would have prevented the pain of waking up at 7 a.m. on multiple Saturdays just to have the sneakers app break your heart again. So when did America's first adjusted for inflation billionaires really emerge? Post-Civil War, baby aka the Gilded Age. In good American fashion, some of these dudes initially made bank from scamming the government. Like selling uniforms during the Civil War that straight up fell to pieces in the rain, hopefully making for some steamy moments on the battlefield. But billionaire status was only really possible with our first nationwide business, railroads. This new transportation network made it possible to ship supplies and consumer goods across the country. And the dudes who built it, like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, soon became the Zuckerbergs and Gateses of their time. Though, thankfully, more stylish. And much like 70s Meryl Streep star power, life for the very wealthy would shoot up drastically over just three decades. By 1890, 73% of the nation's wealth would be held by just 10% of the population. And they do questionable things to show it off, like build a gold toilet or import 10,000 butterflies from Brazil for their daughter's debutante ball. Side note, all the butterflies died and their corpses rained down on the party goers. And what could I say? I would watch the shit out of that TikTok. But our new billionaires needed a way to justify having enough dollar bills to wallpaper the Great Wall of China. Because again, it was pretty new in America to have so much money in the hands of just a few cigar happy dudes. Luckily, they found a little thing called social Darwinism. This intellectual movement took Darwin's views on biological evolutionary competition amongst natural species and applied it very pseudoscientifically to human society. The thinking went, 
in a competitive economy, like on a competitive earth, the creatures who rose to the top did so because they were motherfucking lions who deserved success and also gold encrusted pedestals in their drawing rooms. But despite being huge proponents of the free market, the wealthiest really relied on the government to maintain their status as champions of capitalism. For the most part, that meant keeping government out of their way via laissez-faire economics, because the free market equals bay. This was easy to finagle. Being wealthy gave you a lot of political sway over a Congress stacked with sympathetic millionaires. And if you needed a little help, there was always corruption, bribery, and vote buying. So for a couple decades, the government pretty much f off, rather than say, outlawing child labor or crafting regulations for on-the-job safety as tens of thousands of workers got their legs chomped by railroad machinery in some sick industrial version of Jaws 4. But billionaires were also happy for daddy government to be hands-on when it meant helping their bottom line. That's because federal and state governments gifted railroad companies approximately 100 million government subsidies and 200 million acres of public land between 1861 and 1871 alone. It's not unlike Elon Musk, who celebrated as a role model for free market innovation, will sometimes complain about excessive regulations. Sometimes it can overregulate industries to the point where innovation becomes very difficult. That's despite the fact that the vast majority of Tesla's profit comes from a government mandated regulation that makes other car manufacturers buy carbon credits from them. Anyway, budding tycoons also relied on other shady methods, like manipulating the stock market, building monopolies in order to control prices, and a whole lot of financial f So boring, I'm almost glad I'm not rich. I'm almost glad. But to be fair, even some historical critics admit that without the sheer force and breakneck policies of these wily robber barons, America couldn't have developed as quickly as it did. Which is to say, yes, robber barons helped America industrialize at lightning speed. And at the same time, many of them became well known for their philanthropy, most notably Carnegie, who by his death had donated 300 million to charity. So counterpoint, billionaires equal, sometimes good, to be determined. The fact that some of these guys, including Rockefeller and Carnegie, had worked their way up from humble origins also made them sympathetic success stories. Many folks admired and aspired to be like them, even as their mom and pop general stores were steamrolled by increased corporate consolidation, spearheaded by their favorite millionaire bros. Anyway, the Gilded Age wasn't all counting luxury imported butterfly corpses all day. To understand how the mega wealthy fit into the social order, we have to look at how the other 99% was living. Or that's, that's, that's not right. Yeah, that. See, as America became the world's leading economy, it also became a place of insane, never-before-seen poverty. People who had once survived humbly off the land were increasingly forced to migrate to urban slums where they worked 14-hour days in factories performing the exact same task until they presumably had a Charlie Chaplin-esque breakdown. Okay, it's a good bit. But this was seriously dangerous work, and 35,000 people died each year in factory accidents during the 1880s and 1890s, making the average industrial job somehow seem less safe than modern day commercial skydiving. Meanwhile, by the turn of the century, elementary school for one in five American children looked like the inside of a factory or the pits of a coal mine. In the South, small-scale farmers and especially emancipated black folks working as sharecroppers suffered as farming consolidated and land speculation ran rampant. Many fell into predatory high-interest debt just trying to pay for basic necessities. And across the board, volatile markets fueled by rampant speculation amongst the wealthy led to regular boom and bus cycles that made most people's experience of America feel like the Universal Studios ride Dudley do Rights Ripsaw Falls, which, as we all know, I'm legally banned from attending. Which again is absolutely not how America works over a century later. Dot-com stocks crashed, billions of dollars in venture capital evaporated overnight. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. Unemployment claims skyrocketing with 6.6 .6 million people filing in the last week alone. I'm just kidding. It, it totally does. Hedge funds and the private equity firms that she says has treated the market like a casino. Anyway, there's a reason Gilded Age billionaires were called robber barons. A lot of poor people really wanted to fight back and had no access to Reddit. Railway car magnate George Pullman was buried in a lead-lined coffin within a steel and concrete vault because his family was convinced angry workers would vandalize his grave. You thought Zuckerberg memes were cruel. On a whole, workers refused to silently accept the new realities of the Gilded Age, in which millions worked punishing jobs that collectively enriched a select few lucky dudes. 
That's why in the 1880s alone, there were more than 10,000 strikes, many of them mass strikes that spanned entire cities and regions. And how did the wealthy industry giants respond? With brute force, of course. Business owners would call in their own private militias or even ask Uncle Sam to send in troops. Because if the free market means anything, it means crying to the government over contract disputes. This wasn't just peacekeeping. Strikes were often violently put down. And the National Guard was called on to respond to labor turmoil between 118 and 160 times from 1877 to 1900 alone. Meanwhile, over the years, plenty of well-dressed businessmen would form armed vigilante groups to carry out justice in the streets. Conflict inevitably broke out during working class demonstrations, like the famous Astor Place Opera House riot when pissed off working folks invaded the fancy theater, throwing rotten potatoes and eggs at the actors and shouting, shame, shame, down with the codfish aristocracy, a sentiment I, I personally scream into my pillow every night before I go to bed. Less humorous is the fact that at least 22 people died, and over 100 were injured in that riot alone as a result of the state militia's response. More explicitly labor-related kinds of agitations lasted for decades, like in the 1920 Battle of Blair Mountain, where thousands of coal workers faced off against government and private militias in a battle that saw approximately 1 million rounds of ammunition fired and the dropping of leftover World War I poison, gas, and homemade bombs. Particularly in the 1890s, all of this violent confrontation, gunfire, and death escalated to the point that many Americans worried another civil war was coming. Still, the workers persisted. One 1894 strike even shut down huge swaths of American railroad lines, costing the industry millions in losses. Keep in mind, folks on strike weren't just quibbling over low wages. Many wanted the entire system uprooted, suggesting radical changes like collective ownership of company capital. And in the 1896 presidential election, William Jennings Bryan became the first major political candidate to build his brand off of working class populist rage. He was beat out when America's elite united to throw millions behind William McKinley's competing campaign. A lot has happened since the rise of America's billionaire class and the riots and strikes against them. The Great Depression gave way to the New Deal's civilized capitalism. And by the middle of the century, it was culturally not that cool to be super rich or to show off your wealth. Some old money families even sold off their ancestral homes to become orphanages or old age homes. Unions and the companies they worked for sort of found a bit of equilibrium. Unions stopped agitating for the overthrow of capitalism and businesses started providing living wages and substantial worker protections. Wealth inequality continued to decrease from its gilded age heights. But over the last 50 years, the story's gotten a lot more complicated. Perhaps most importantly for the very wealthy, finance has increasingly become the center of the US economy, now akin to what manufacturing was in the Gilded Age. And if national railroads provided new opportunities for never before seen wealth, financialization is that, but on roids, thanks in part to developments like hedge funds, venture capitalism, and private equity. According to author and Canadian politician Christian Freeland, in the 70s, finance began a transformation from an industry dominated by large institutions whose job was a conservative stewardship of other people's money into a sector whose moguls were iconoclastic entrepreneurs who specialized in risk, leverage, and outsized returns. At the same time, we saw an increased return to economic laissez-faire policies, with the usual caveats. Government's interference is welcome when it benefits the top 1%'s bottom line, as best exemplified by the bailout of the big banks following the Great Recession. The net result of the past five or so decades? Economist Simon Johnson explains that America now has the world's most advanced oligarchy. And unlike the railroad tycoons, who were at least producing something that helped the lives of average Americans, the financial activity generating billions for the wealthiest today is not, accounting for 25% of corporate profits, but just 4% of jobs. And by just about every metric, the economy has increasingly worked better and better for the top 1%. Today, America has almost 800 billionaires. What's more, vast economic wealth has become largely self-perpetuating. As economist Thomas Piketty notes, the current economic climate privileges creation of wealth for those who already have existing wealth. At the same time, life has gotten worse for the majority of Americans in just about every measurable way. And for folks who set out to improve their lot? Well, it's harder than ever before because of a little thing called the Great Gatsby Curve, which is not about Leonardo DiCaprio's, you know, Rather, it's a depressing graph showing that higher income inequality in a given country makes it harder to rise above your station. That's at least partly why most young Americans are worse off than their parents for the first time in modern history, regardless of their genius mac and cheese cost-saving hacks. Okay. 
Oh, uh, uh, great. No, seriously, it's, it's great. It really works. None of what's happened is that surprising. Over the past half century, the very wealthy have recreated the economy in a very not fun funhouse mirror image of the Gilded Age. And with the 2010 Citizens United decision bringing floods of new money into politics, economic power breeds political power like never before. The billionaireization of politics is perhaps literalized by self-financed political campaigns like those of Michael Bloomberg. Though he proved once and for all that unlike my 7th grade nemesis Chip Vandero of the Vandero dynasty once said, money can't buy popularity. F*** you Chip, and f*** everyone that stands with Vandero and the whole Vandero clan because me and the boys are coming for you, okay? But what's really most surprising to us though is how little pushback we've seen to this reality. As compared to the late 19th century working class movements, the reaction to growing wealth stratification has been pretty anemic. Sure, there's outburst of rage in the form of Occupy Wall Street and even aspects of the Black Lives Matter movement, but compared to the widespread agitation that characterized the Gilded Age, it's been pretty quiet. Meanwhile, the remnants of social Darwinism remain strong in most AP economics classes, in spite of the fact that the very wealthy continue to prosper off government subsidies. There's also the continued cultural lionization of the uber-rich, particularly as with the Gilded Age, for those who appear to be self-made. Rare success stories like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Whitney Wolf Heard foster a false sense of accessibility, suggesting that all of us, if properly motivated, can climb up a social ladder that almost ubiquitously functions as a down escalator. Of course, as the events of GameStock have shown, people still do dislike or at least distrust billionaires. Like, a lot. Possibly as much as the folks throwing eggs at the Astor Opera House did. But perhaps the illustrious Reddit-inspired stock market debacle kind of explains the change that's happened. Rather than questioning the rules of the game that the very, very wealthy are playing, like workers during the Gilded Age did, we're mostly just eager for a piece of the action, which is why I'm still all in on AMC. Hold on, it's my hedge fund manager. That failed too? <laughs> but anyway, what do you guys think? Are billionaires awesome philanthropists with great baby name ideas? Or are they a pasty face menace to society? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to all our patrons for your support. Hit that subscribe button like a Pinkerton agent knocking out a peaceful steel worker, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.